I'd like to introduce Stuart McNish, who uh, is the host of Conversations That Matter, which you see on the internet and podcasts and in the Vancouver Sun. Uh, incidentally, Stu will be hosting a new monthly video and podcast we're starting called Salmon Matter that will help us educate the broader public about the important work of salmon conservation. But today, Stu will be moderating a conversation with Jason Huang, who we are delighted to welcome as our new Vice President for Salmon at PSF. Jason is going to introduce a little bit about his history and, and passion for salmon in his comments. Uh, but Jason will also be sharing some thinking around climate change and landscape change, changes and how PSF is wrapping our brain around these big concepts and what we can be doing in the future to continue to be a catalyst. So with no further ado, I'll ask Stu McNish to come up as well as Jason Huang. I love salmon. I love talking to people about salmon. I love doing good things for salmon. And so my passion and interest in salmon and fish goes right back to when I was a kid. I grew up in North Delta. I used to ride my little bike down the Fraser River and catch whatever I could catch. We'd catch sturgeon, we'd catch salmon, we'd catch a little bit of everything. And uh, I've, I've always loved fish. I, uh, one of my uh, mentors at DFO was uh, laughing uh, at my send-off gig. He said, do you remember your job interview? You know, we asked you all these questions and you answered them all and you knew a lot of stuff. And I asked you, is there anything else you want to say? And I said, I just want you to know that I love fish. <laughs> Firstly, uh, big picture. Uh, there's a, a report that came out late this summer uh, from the uh, International Panel on Climate Change, and it was looking at the ocean and the cryosphere, so glaciers and things like that, and looking at changing conditions uh, on, in our climate in, in, in the whole ocean. So this isn't specific to British Columbia or Canada. And there's a whole bunch of findings. It's a giant technical scientific report. But you know, as an extract and, uh, and some high-level things that come from this, ocean temperatures are generally rising. And that is changing what's happening in the ecosystem. Fish and other uh, critters are moving around in response to this. Uh, ocean productivity is changing. Uh, in the case of salmon, at least in recent years, it seems unfavorably, perhaps favorably to other things. And salmon uh, spend, as, as you will all know, a big part of their life out in the ocean. And you know, one of the big takeaways is for me is that Things are changing, we have to be aware of that, and the management decisions and considerations we make can't look back and say, how did it used to be? We have to look from here forward and say, if this is what's out there, what are we going to do? Similarly, at about the same time as this uh, international report on uh, the ocean and, and climate came out, DFO also released a state of salmon report. It's a bit of a hard thing to even uh, frame out in, in a sentence or a paragraph or even a page. There are over 8,000 combinations of species and streams in BC. They've experienced varying degrees of impacts and issues over the years. There's essentially 432 conservation units, you can, sockeye units, uh, pink salmon units, chum, coho, chinook. And these are basically management units that are uh, genetically independent. If they were to disappear, uh, it's unlikely that they would be recolonized from fish with the same genetic background. So these are basically salmon management units. So when someone says, how are salmon doing? It, there is no simple answer to that. It depends which salmon and where and over what timeline. Uh, there's a lot of common um, takeaways from, from these reports that have been published recently. In general, po northern populations of salmon are doing better than southern populations. This is not a rule. There are certainly some southern populations that are doing pretty well and some northern ones that are not. But if you kind of uh, take the high level view over um, a moderate uh, timeline, northern populations are generally doing better than southern populations. Another broad generality, but it has a, a fairly significant effect, is that salmon that spend more of their life history in fresh water seem to be doing more poorly than salmon that spend less of their life history in fresh water. Some of the takeaway uh, that I would frame here is that many of the climate related trends, uh, see, at least currently, are not changing the equation in favor of salmon. They're probably making things more difficult. But at the same time, there are a lot of things that we can do to moderate or mitigate these effects and try to push some of these buttons in a way that's more favorable for salmon and maybe doesn't uh, uh, 
the environmental effects can be mitigated and moderated through uh, specific things that we can do in some of our programming and some of our policy. The hatchery and salmon enhancement story is a complicated one. It, it's somewhat contentious. You know, are hatcheries good or bad? It, there is no such thing as a straightforward answer to that question. There are benefits and risks. There's all kinds of considerations that need to be applied to a hatcheries. Hatcheries are, in my view, a very important and essential part of the salmon management framework, but it's also not a simple thing where if we have a salmon problem, let's make more fish from hatcheries. First, a bit of a frame, like what is the hatchery context? Why are hatcheries run in, in British Columbia and the Yukon? They're, they're largely run under the umbrella of Department of Fisheries and Oceans under the Salmon Enhancement Program. It's not just about making more fish to go fishing. There's a, an objective to rebuild vulnerable stocks. There is an objective to provide harvest opportunities. There's an objective to work with First Nations and coastal communities to support their economic development. And there's an objective under the Salmon Enhancement Program uh, overall to improve fish habitat, to allow the natural habitat to sustain salmon populations. All of these things can be independent, but they also all interact. On this slide, again, just to set some context, not all hatcheries are the same. Not all hatcheries in BC and the Yukon are the same. And certainly British Columbia hatcheries are not the same as some of the giant US hatcheries that have gotten, I think, uh, a fair amount of attention in the news over the last few years. And it's, I would describe it as that's the source of the, of the debate around I, hatcheries might be bad. They're causing these kinds of effects. But what the, the, some of the criticisms that have been applied to hatcheries have been applied to these monster hatcheries making 50 million fish a year and dumping them out into one river. We've never done that in Canada, or at least in BC. We don't do that uh, now, and there's no plan to do that. The hatchery system in BC has always been more nuanced. It's been about, let's support fish here from this native stock. Let's try to work reasonably well with the natural ecosystem and do something that complements the, the natural stock. And there's an array of different hatcheries. There's large hatcheries run by DFO. There are these uh, economic development hatcheries that are, are generally smaller, but some of them are quite large, that are, are run more um, with the local communities. And then there are public involvement hatcheries that are generally smaller production, doing things right in a local watershed, usually volunteer driven uh, and uh, uh, supported by PSF and, and uh, other supporters uh, from the communities. In the current context, what are we seeing right now? Well, there are a number of weak stocks, and those weak stocks are, have, at least this year, uh, resulted in fishery restrictions that were very hurtful to a lot of people that have uh, investments in economy and uh, um, uh, their, their, their whole life invested in that. It, it, had, it hurt uh, anybody that wanted to go fishing, whether you're a First Nation fisher, a recreational fisher, it hurt the commercial sector. And this occurred while at the same time, you know, we were hearing at PSF regularly that fishing is really good out there. And, and uh, it was frustrating to many people that you couldn't go catch these fish, but these weak stocks are mixed in there. And in, in that regard, there's been a fair amount of um, uh, uh, outcry f to solve that problem. And some of that has been, so let's turn to hatcheries, let's fix this, let's get more fish out there, and then everybody will be able to go fishing and the salmon will be better. One of the things that we are advancing from PSF under this BC SRIF, which is the BC Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund, is to actually do a hatchery effectiveness review. We were funded by this uh, program that the federal and provincial government are co-funding. Uh, we got approval in July, and we're just starting out now to bring staff into our program and do this study. But we really think this is going to help look at how effective current production has been and provide some recommendations for what can come forward. This is a, a generic watershed. It's got two streams, stream one and stream two. They're both the same. They both make 100 fish a year. Uh, no one's fishing for them right now. But then you put a hatchery in place to add 100 fish to stream two. If you do that, you know, this is just sort of your basic salmon math. You've now got 300 fish out there, uh, 100 wild ones from each stream, and 100 from the hatchery on stream two. And then you go fishing, you catch 100 fish because you put 100 extra ones out there. But just in the basic math, one third are coming from stream one because they're all pooled out there now in front of the, uh, in, in the ocean in front of the stream, and two thirds are going to come from stream two. So what's happening here? You've still got 200 salmon. But in fishing the enhanced stock, the unenhanced stock is actually starting to decline. 
And I realize this is a great oversimplification, but it's really important to understand how these kinds of things can work. Because if you run this again, a second year, well, what happens? Well, that effect carries forward. It, it, it digs in a little further. And then if you run it again into year three, you've driven the stock down by over half just by running a hatchery for three cycles and going fishing uh, in a standard way. Now, I'm not saying that this is always what happens with hatcheries. This is a massive oversimplification. Doing things like tagging the fish and managing your fishery so that you can target the tagged fish, release the wild fish, are all things that can be brought into play to uh, actually get a positive benefit from a hatchery. But you know, just looking at this kind of math, if you don't plan your fishery management well, you will get an outcome like this where you ran a hatchery, the stream you're enhancing is doing really well but the stream that you're not enhancing, you know, down the road or right beside it, is starting to decline and we're driving it into a conservation problem. And, you know, if, so if you amplified your hatchery production, you actually make the problem even worse, faster. And so this is not a condemnation of hatcheries. This is an illustration of what I would call potential un unintended effects. And it's just one of the things that I want to introduce because the, the, the message is hatcheries can be really helpful. You know, I think they're an important part of our future management, uh, current and future management, but it's about doing them the right way, the right place at the right time, and really importantly, having a fishery plan that makes sure we get the benefits without having unintended consequences of hatcheries. So um, a little bit on habitat and, and habitat restoration. The context, and uh, you know, it kind of frames from what I've, uh, I, I introduced at the start, many salmon populations are down, salmon habitat's been affected by human development, and climate change is adding new factors we don't completely understand. This photo here is from a small stream in the uh, BC interior in, in the middle Shushwap area. This is a stream that has you know, those stream type Chinook I was talking about that spend a year uh, in fresh water. It has coho, and the thing I draw your attention to in this picture is that wet spot. That's what happens when a farmer, when during a drought, turns on their pump and waters their field. The stream is drawn down real time. If you're not out there, you don't see this. But imagine that you know, this stream is full of salmon, juvenile salmon trying to um, live their one year in fresh water before they go to sea, and this happens. And this is what happens in streams in the interior, east coast of Vancouver Island, sometimes when there's a drought. And farmers are doing their normal thing that they're entitled to do. They're growing food for all of us. But these kinds of things can have a really significant negative effect on salmon. These are things we can do something about. If we know this is happening, we can talk to farmers about how quickly they take their water, uh, coordinating when they take their water, storing some water so that they can irrigate without causing these kinds of effects. But you have to get right down into the stream to these detailed kinds of things to know what's happening and then to do things that change and make it better. And just to kind of amplify some of the stories around these climate change effects, these two pictures are from uh, the uh, upper part of the Bonaparte watershed where the Elephant Hill wildfire went through. The, the forest land base gets burnt. Uh, typical summer storms come through, wash out gullies that have been stable for a long time. You turn the, the picture on the right side is where that gully washout went. That's how much sediment and other material came out. Flooded this poor person's house and vehicles. Right behind their house is Hat Creek, tributary to the Bonaparte, Chinook, Steelhead, Coho, and all of this stuff is, is sluicing down into these streams. So some of the current PSF ideas and priorities. I think this room will be relatively familiar with the Sailor Sea Marine Survival Program. And that program that has been uh, running for the past, I think it's five years now, has learned a tremendous amount about what has been driving salmon in the Salish Sea. And uh, we've identified things like the importance of freshwater flow and how much that changes juvenile salmon survival and, uh, and potential if, um, makes predation on juvenile salmon even easier for predators. Uh, things around nearshore habitat and estuaries, how hatchery production is not uh, as effective as wild production. Uh, and we've taken these kinds of science findings and are currently now saying, okay, we've learned this, now what can we do about it? And we're pursuing studies and actual on the ground projects to do things like explore how we can maybe mitigate some of these predation effects from harbor seals, how we can do seed banking from warm water resistant kelp, warm water tolerant kelp to reseed kelp beds and do kind of climate thoughtful nearshore restoration, recognizing that sea level is probably going to change. And so, you know, not turning to an old toolbox, but turning to a new toolbox to try to do some things on the ground that will make the habitat and environment better for salmon.
We have uh, a team that for a number of years now have been developing something called the Pacific Salmon Explorer. If you're interested in information and looking at a story around what's going on with salmon, um, we, this project is, is really moving rapidly now. They're working on Vancouver Island and the Fraser, but by early next year, most of BC will be covered, and this will be the first ever comprehensive assembly of stock and habitat data. It's a really powerful thing because, you know, anybody in this room will know you can't manage what you can't measure or assess, and this is a platform that will allow us and anybody to have access to the same information that will be validated that can then inform management decisions. On the habitat side, something that we are, are advancing now is a climate action plan for BC salmon. This kind of goes to some of the story I've told about, okay, here's what's happening out there, and saying, so what are we going to do about it? The first idea that we have is looking at uh, assessing potential impediments to salmon migration in the main stem river. So in the Fraser River, you know, we've all heard of the Hell's Gate Fishway. We've seen a lot of coverage of the Big Bar Slide. But what we've learned through a little bit of investigation is that salmon are having a hard time getting past some points in the Fraser River now. There's a point in Yale they have a hard time getting past. The uh, Hell's Gate Fishway was built uh, just after World War II to standards and to environmental conditions from that time. You know, things are different now. And so when you talk about, well, what can you do to make things better for salmon? If we could save them, you know, a, a few days on their migrating journey, uh, by making those barriers a little bit easier for them to pass. That could be the difference between them dying before they spawn or getting to the spawning grounds and su successfully reproducing. So we want to go and look at these barriers and say, what can we do to make them better and to improve fish passage for salmon, you know, right up the artery of the Fraser River so they can get up to their spawning grounds and do their thing. Uh, we are also wanting to do a landscape strategy for salmon following these major fires. So not just projects on the ground, but really developing a whole playbook to say when we, we think fires are going to continue to happen. So when they do, how do we get out there right away and do things to try to maybe prevent those gully washouts or stabilize that landscape as quickly as possible, focusing on what do salmon need on this landscape. And then we also have ideas to look at hatchery capacity and uh, uh, see in places where there is no capacity right now in a major way in the middle and upper Fraser, where we do have conservation concerns, what kind of strategies and infrastructure uh, would help in order to manage and rebuild those populations. But the, the point of this is to say, I've talked about three things. We know there's a lot more stuff to look at. We know, for instance, looking at a water strategy and helping to manage for drought would be a good idea. Uh, integrated watershed plans, uh, protected areas. So we have a number of other things that we will uh, develop uh, project ideas for and add to this uh, climate adaptation strategy for salmon. And uh, you know, we're really looking forward to taking these things from idea to implementation phase. When I go through these things, I, I tend to kind of get be, focus on technical, operational, scientific things. But a really important thing, none of this will work if we don't include people who care about salmon in the action, in the conversation, and in the participation in looking after this resource. So stewardship and education are really important. I, I use this uh, a highlight from the speech that Romeo LeBlanc, when he was a fisheries minister, made to the BC Wildlife Federation in 1978. And, and the takeaway from his message is that the investment here is more about the investment in the people who will care about and steward the salmon resource. The spawning channels and the hatcheries, those are infrastructure, but it's about having the people care that will make the difference, and I think that holds true today. It's, a, it's an excellent message. And so, uh, closing thoughts, uh, it, it, I guess this is you know, my opportunity to be on the pulpit, but I think conservation of wild salmon must continue to be our collective priority. Uh, we have a moral imperative as our generation to do everything we can and pass on something good to future generations. Uh, government is not able to solve all this on their own. There is a role for everyone. And I think there's a role for people, uh, for all of us to act individually and collectively together to help uh, tilt the balance uh, maybe more in favor of salmon into the future.